Welcome to the Auto X Show. Now sit back and relax because we've got a really special year-end show for you today. Ishan gets behind the wheel of a pair of really special and really fast Porsches. And Abhishek collects a quartet of really unique and really special machines to give you a better understanding of the true genesis of the SUV. But first, some speed. Panama is the perfect kind of Porsche if you have a family. You know, you've got four seats, enough space for the luggage to go in, and yet it's sporty enough. Even in the second generation car, it looks really good too. But with the GTS, Porsche's added a little more to the Panamera. There's more power, there's less weight, and the suspension's focused to really enhance the driving appeal. So what am I doing today? I'm in Bahrain at the International Circuit, the Formula One track. I'm driving the Panamera GTS, Let's see how it is. on an F1 circuit at night. Well, that's something special. And I think it suits the Panamera GTS absolutely perfectly. It's a special car after all. You know, I think Porsche's done a great job with the styling of the Panamera. The first gen, despite the fact that I'm a Porsche fanboy, I, well, I didn't like the first gen. The new car though is a fantastically big improvement. And I think in the Sport Turismo, that's the version I'm driving, the whole wagon look really works for the car. Of course, it's a GTS, so what they've also done is focus on the driving appeal. Now, all Porsches are driver's cars. I mean, that's the USP of the brand. But this is even more focused. You get a 4-litre V8 engine with twin turbos inside the V, 460 horsepower, 620 Nm of torque. And despite its weight, which is close to two tons, it does 0 to 100 in 4.1 seconds. Uh, the eight-speed double-clutch PDK gearbox works really, really well. And I love the sound it makes in sport mode. I mean, you can actually feel the engine revving, growling, the pop packs when you lift off. It's, it's a great experience. Of course, being a GTS, it also gets special visual touches. The front and the rear uh, bumpers are different. There's lots of black detailing, black wheels. The Panamera badging is in black. And black and red theme is also carried over to the interior. So as you can see, I've got red seat belts, Alcantara steering, Alcantara roof lining, and this gorgeous black dashboard with black aluminum inserts. And the outstanding feeling when you're driving the Panamera, especially in GTS version, you know, it's the quality, just the fittings, how, how well the car's been put together, how, you know, it's, feels like it's carved out of one piece of steel, that kind of feeling. Uh, we drove it on, on the roads of uh, Bahrain earlier. Roads here are staggeringly good. So I really can't tell you how the ride quality is going to be with the standard fit air suspension and 20 inch wheels. I suspect it's going to be a little stiff because it's a GTS after all. It's supposed to be good to be used on track. It's supposed to be sporty. So that, well, that's something we'll have to test when it comes to India, but on the track, when pushing, the car is staggeringly good to drive. The steering has a lot of feel. Uh, and I think if you've sort of got a family, if you need to transport three or four people, if you need luggage space, and yet you need a car that can be driven on track, in fact, the engine oil system, the sump, and the system in this car is specially designed to make sure that you can use it at the track without any oil starvation problems. So it's, it's, it's a car designed for that. So, 
on the weekdays you can take your kids out you can take your wife out you can go on a long road trip and on the weekends you can even take the car on track without having to worry about it uh, it also comes with stand uh, with optional ceramic brakes which work really well big tires 275 is at the front 315 is at the rear so traction is never a problem even when on the fast curves of the Bahrain circuit uh, by the way great circuit what elevation changes it's a phenomenal experience to drive here uh, even on those fast curves, when you're trying to apply power, the four-wheel drive system, the standard fit four-wheel drive system, automatically finds traction. You have, despite the 460 horsepower, 620 Nm, you have no lack of traction. And it just sort of powers out of corners, like, you know, like it's a piece of cake for the car. If there's a problem with the car, uh, you know, with the second gen Panamera, the styling is no longer a problem. But if there's a problem, and there will be when it's launched in India, it'll be that you'll be doling out more than two I think I suspect around two crores plus, and that perhaps is the only thing that you can fault against the Panamera. In everything else, in the sport tourism version, especially in the quality, in the driving feel, the driving experience, Panamera is a phenomenal car. Now don't go anywhere because we've got one more very special Porsche coming up right after the break. Welcome back to the AutoX show. Now we've still got some adrenaline pumping action to go. This time it's the Porsche Cayenne Turbo. It's a problem to accept the Cayenne. It's the absolute antithesis of what a Porsche is. Uh, it's not small, it's not lift, it's not light, and it's hard to accept. But when you look at the sales numbers, the Cayenne and the Macan to an extent are the ones that allow Porsche to make cars like the 911, the 718, the 918 Spider, you know, everything else. So this is what brings the money in. What we're driving today is the top dog of the Cayenne range, the Cayenne Turbo. 4-liter V8, twin turbocharged, 542 horsepower, 770 Nm of torque. There's a lot to like. And even though on a philosophical, on a basic idea level, I don't think a Cayenne is a Porsche, but I'm going to drive it today and see how it works out. The interior of the Cayenne, of course, is another matter. Porsche has been known, it, it's been their hallmark for a number of years, that the quality of their cars, the quality of the interiors, the quality of the fittings, how the switches work is fantastic. And it's no different in the Cayenne. Uh, the general fit and finish level, the trim levels, the way everything stitches together, the way everything melts together is fantastic. You get these haptic feedback switches now, instead of physical switches. So they work quite well, but I think they're an acquired taste. It's not some. It, it's still a little odd. I think you get used to it once you uh, start using these switches. There's of course the big screen uh, for the multimedia and the car settings. Like I have the chassis height on medium. You can adjust the because of the air suspension. You can adjust the chassis height, the sportiness, the sport plus. There's individual on the steering. You have the uh, dial that lets you select all the different uh, driving modes. There's also. Thankfully, there's also an analog tachometer. So the rev counter is still an analog device. Whereas the other dials are now gone. They're, they are now dominated by two small screens that give you all the information. But just uh, even though this is the top spec iron, uh, but just the fittings, the, the fit and finish, the quality, how well it's built, that feels very impressive. Now you might be a purist like me who thinks that a real Porsche is a 911. There are quite a few of us actually. But fact of the matter is, in the early 2000s, when Porsche launched the first Cayenne, uh, the SUV rage was just starting. Today, of course, it's on a different level. Everybody wants an SUV. Uh, uh, everybody loves an SUV. They are global bestsellers. And what the Cayenne did for Porsche was allow them volumes, numbers, sales numbers, profits that uh, had never been done before in the brand's history. So in this third-gen car, uh, I, I might not be 
a total fan of the Cayenne as an idea, but the fact of the matter it sells, people love it. And in the turbo version, I can see why. It's roomy, it's nice, there's a huge amount of head, I mean, space in general. Uh, you can take your family along with you. In the turbo, you've got the same 4-litre V8, similar 4-litre V8 as the Panamera GTS that we're reviewing on the other section of the show. Uh, 542 horsepower, 770 Nm of torque, 8-speed automatic uh, Triptronic gearbox. Now the power, despite the car's size, the weight, it's fast, it's addictive, it's quite nice to drive. The gearbox works really well, the steering is responsive, you have, some, you have a lot of feel in the steering which is so nice to see uh, because in a lot of cars today there is virtually no steering feel but not with the Cayenne Turbo. It, the engine is very responsive, you don't feel like it's turbocharged. Uh, it's that quick, there's no turbo lag, virtually no turbo lag. So, uh, there is one shortcoming price. People like me will never be able to afford a Cayenne Turbo. At just under 2 crores X showroom, it's a lot of money. But if you want a fast SUV that you can drive every day, uh, it, despite the big 21 inch wheels, actually the suspension is quite nice. It's not too stiff, it's air suspension. You can tune it to different modes, you can change the ride height, the all-wheel drive, the power, the performance. It's hard not to like a Cayenne Turbo. So, I might have said earlier that I don't like the idea of it, but driving the car for the past two days, uh, exploring its performance, looking at its practicality, uh, would I drive a Cayenne Turbo every day? Yes, I would. It's that good. Like I said again, only problem is perhaps that the price is north of 2 crores. It's not for everybody, not everyone can afford it, but if you can, it's hard to find a go-fast SUV than the Cayenne Turbo. Now, while we're on the subject of Porsches, I can't let you go without showing you some images of the brand new Porsche 911. Now, this is what I tweeted when I first saw the Porsche 992. That's the internal designation of Porsche's 8th generation 911. Now this is a car that Porsche has honed to absolute perfection over the past 55 years. Every year over the past half century, Porsche have made it that little bit better. But if there were the last drops of fuel available on this planet, the car that I would fill up for one last hurrah is this. This is a Singer Porsche. And if you don't know what that is, head to our website, autox.com, to check out a feature on this very machine. Now, in 2018, Land Rover celebrated its 70th anniversary. And to mark the occasion, we headed to the off-road adventure zone in Gurgaon with this quartet of very special machines. Today, for us at AutoX, it's a very special day here, for we have some of the most capable off-road vehicles ever to have been made. For if it weren't for these vehicles, modern exploration would have been a whole lot slower. Military, rescue and aid operations would have faced far more grave challenges. Because it's said that at one point of time, a third of the world's population, the first car they ever saw, was a Land Rover. And no off-road story is complete if you don't have a Land Cruiser. But coming to 2018, well, this year, Land Rover is celebrating 70 years of its existence. And for 67 of those years, the mighty series models that culminated in the legendary Defender were taking center stage. So it's these models that have gone on from establishing Land Rover's capabilities to defining its grid. But to see where it started, where this genesis began, it's here with the Series 1 where you will see how things began. And uh, well, I'm sure you're wondering where this pristine slice of history of the Series 1 came from. Well, it belongs to none other than Ashish Gupta, director and founder of Cougar Motorsports. Uh, so he's going to tell us a few words about his story with the Series 1, which he lovingly calls Jolene. Well, we came across this car in uh, Mani Banjang and it is owned by the president 
of the Manibhanjang Land Rovers Owners Association. It's been working uh, very hard for many years on that route from Manibhanjang to Sandakfu, carrying people and goods up and down. And it is one of the few remaining petrol Series 1 vehicles which is still running on, the, on that route. We immediately fell in love with it. We tried to convince him for a few months to part with it and finally he agreed. So we bought it off him and uh, got it restored in that region itself. There's a very well-developed ecosystem of mechanics, parts, retrofitters, people who worked on these cars since the last 30 to 40 years. So we got it restored uh, there. A lot of body parts, etc. We searched around the world. Something came from Amsterdam, something came from UK, some stuff came from Australia. Put it all together in time for the Land Rover 70 years celebration. That's the result over here. So this is a 1955 Series 1 86-inch Land Rover. And and uh, we managed to get the, a copy of the dispatch register from the uh, plant in UK. So it was actually dispatched from UK on 17th of June 1955. Uh, to a dealership in Calcutta called Devas Garage and then since then has been uh, you know in various parts uh, parts of West Bengal and, and Northeast. Oh, that's a beautiful story. Ashish in fact is going to show us a little bit about the capabilities of the Series 1 although not too much because this is a pristine vehicle. So let's take it ahead. The time frame that the Series 1 represents is in fact from the very inception of the four-wheel drive vehicle. So it's got locking hubs at the front, a twin-speed low-range gearbox and leaf springs with a spring under axle configuration. History has proved that this was a successful formula as this very configuration was used for decades from its adoption in the 1940s. This 1955 Series 1 comes with a 2-litre 4-cylinder petrol engine that has plenty of low-end torque which comes in very handy both on and off-road. And despite being 63 years in age, this Series 1 still deals with off-road obstacle as a duck takes to water. And while you may think it looks a little crude, the Series 1 feels ever so refined from behind the wheel. What really surprised me was just how light the clutch pedal was and the ease with which you could slot through the 4-speed gearbox despite the fact that you have to double declutch through the first two gears since there is no synchro mesh. I fortunately happen to be from one of the last generations probably that drove carbureted cars. And well, uh, there's a different beauty to them. They're so mechanical and you can feel every bit of what is going on. The way you feed in power and you change gears, everything is very organic. Uh, so on that front, uh, the Series 1 today reminded me of my uh, days when I started driving. And um, well, it's something else really. It's so capable. You just saw in the footage there, uh, you know, it's a fairly simple looking vehicle and it is simple. But despite that, uh, its capabilities were so good on the off-road front. Uh, and it, of course, is the standing pillar of Land Rover today. Moving on from the Series 1 to the Defender brings the obvious to light in no time. While they do look different, a closer look at the boxy proportions is enough to see the uncanny design similarities. I mean, yes, the fenders are less prominent now and incorporate the headlamps, but that V-shaped bonnet, detachable roof and foldable windscreen are all aspects they share in common. Step inside and aside from the plastic dashboard, door pad inserts, modern switchgear, everything including the ergonomics are not very far away from those of the Series 1. But don't think for a moment that Land Rover did not improve the off-road capabilities over the decades. For Defenders came with long travel coil spring suspension, anti-roll bars, modern engines and crucially a locking center differential. All of this combined with its insane ground clearance an admirable approach, departure and ramp over angles along with its stocky 2.5 litre TD5 diesel engine means that the Defender is pretty much invincible off-road. A fact witnessed by the extensive preference for the Defender across purposes from explorers to conservationists to the UN to armed forces. It was the off-roader of choice for the harshest of terrains and conditions. As a child, I would have dreams, you know, I couldn't sleep. I would stay awake at night and then dream about one day somehow driving a Land Rover Defender. And today, well, uh, the dreams come true. I have actually driven a Defender. And uh, as you could see in that footage, it's crazy cross-axle articulation. 
uh, this thing when you put it in low range has so much torque you don't even need to feather the throttle it'll just go up and incline on its own so uh, there's a reason why defense forces military you and everybody's used a defender for decades as their vehicle of choice to reach far away places and uh, well the defender today has just showed me why it's got those credentials as you can tell, there was very little that changed mechanically and aesthetically during the initial breed of four-wheel drive vehicles. And it was only from the 80s and 90s onwards that SUVs were transitioning into lifestyle vehicles with better ergonomics and on-road dynamics. And this 80 series Land Cruiser is testimony to this fact. For not only does it look more polished from the outside, but on-road driving dynamics became more car-like too. The driving experience itself was made more comfortable with better interiors, easier controls and more features. That said, powertrains of these vehicles were very much in sync with that of the vehicles from the Defenders era, with similar suspension setups and drivetrains. So this Land Cruiser has been actually quite a treat because as good and as capable as the Land Rovers are, even Defender, it's for like serious stuff and for which reason it feels more hardcore. Whereas this, this is extremely easy to drive off-road. Low range, there's plenty of grunt from the six cylinder turbo diesel engine. So you have plenty of torque and it's all delivered in a very refined and sophisticated and comfortable manner. All of which makes this a very comfortable off-road vehicle. It's very capable and yet it's extremely comfortable too. And it would appear that the comfort quotient really caught on in the 4x4 space. For SUVs are becoming more and more luxurious by the day. And if we are to showcase the pinnacle of luxury SUVs, we would invariably have to turn once again to Land Rover. From its humble origins, the British mark today makes four-wheel drive vehicles that literally spoil you silly. Take this Discovery for instance. Armed with a barrage of driver aids such as different surface modes for off-roading, hill descent control, all-terrain progress control that leaves you to merely steer the car while it drives itself off-road. Then there is the matter of wading depth sensors, automatically adjustable air suspension that can raise or lower the height as needed. This SUV provides an off-road experience worthy of kings. I'm also happy to report that despite all of its clever electronics, the Discovery still manages to provide a great deal of connect and off-road feedback to the driver about what each wheel is doing. So I really have to tip my hat to Land Rover for making the perfect modern four-wheel drive SUV. So there you are, having walked you through all the different generations of four-wheel drive vehicles, I can tell you this, that today's luxury 4x4s are supremely comfortable and capable. But in all honesty, it was the era of the Defender that provided the pinnacle of off-road ability, for the simple reason that they were built to a purpose. It can get very tough while off-roading and you need an equally tough vehicle that can weather the storm and avoid body and electronic damage to ensure your vehicle can soldier on. I'm afraid that modern SUVs are far too fragile with the delicate body panels picking up damage while off-roading ever so easily. Little wonder then that the original Land Rover from the Series 1 to the Defender remained in production for an unbelievable 67 years. In conclusion though, I would have to say that the basic principles of a lightweight 4x4 such as the Series 1 with good approach departure and ramp over angles along with knobbly tires is valid even today. Well, that's all the time we have for you today. Follow us on social media for your daily dose of all things automotive. And remember, it's chaos out there. So buckle up and always wear your helmets. We'll see you again next weekend on the AutoX Show.